So th this is another video in the series from 1133 for UTSA. We're going to be talking about 11.7, the chain rule, and we're going to start with a short review of composite functions. So typically, um, for most functions just in general, especially so far in this course, the typical thing we do for functions is that x is the independent variable, the input, input variable. Okay. In other words, the independent variable. And then y is the output variable. I'm missing a the, that's fine, output variable. In other words, it is the dependent variable. It depends upon what you plug in for x. Okay. Now, we don't have to do that. There are exceptions. You could say, oh, well, what about like um, exceptions? Is that how you spell exceptions? I think it is. What about like uh, supply and demand curves? Like you say, oh, the, the price that the, the producers want um, as a function of the quantity demanded would be that, and Q is the input, and P is the output. That could happen. Um, we had examples where we had like uh, the velocity is some function of time, right? When we were talking about rates of change, that, that's something that you could have. You could also have like um, the, uh, the revenue is some function of the number of widgets, right? So there's, there are exceptions, and we don't have to have X and Y all the time, um, and, but we will typically use X. We could use, you know, we could say R equals F of W for widgets if we wanted to. We could have been doing that all along. There's no reason to use X necessarily. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what a composite function looks like, just to get a little bit more, um, uh, remind you of those, the way some of these things are written. So let's say um, we have two functions. Let's say we have f of x equals, uh, let's say x squared, okay? And then g of x, let's say equals x plus 2. So I could say, uh, I'm going to call this one my, my outside function. Okay, and this one I'm going to call the inside function. I'm going to say that I'm going to plug g into f. So I could say, okay, f of g of x. All right, this would be f of whatever g of x is, x plus 2 in this case. Okay, we've dealt with something like this before. We dealt with f of x plus h. This is somewhat similar. So f of g of x, well, that's going to be um, x plus 2 squared. Right? And if you foil that out, you get x squared plus 4x plus four, right? If you reverse that and go, no, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch these labels. You could do that if you wanted to and say, oh, well, what is, um, what is g of f of x, right? You could say, okay, well, that's gonna be g of x squared. I'm sorry, g of x uh, squared, yeah, g of x squared. Well, that's going to be um, x squared plus 2 because g adds 2 to whatever the input is. Um, now, notice that in this case, in the first case, x plus 2 is filling in for x in the, the, the first case. Okay? x plus 2 is a version of x. What do I mean by that? x equals x plus 2. What does that mean? Well, x is the input variable for the function, f. But since we're plugging in g of x, g of x is the input. We're replacing x in the function f with the entirety of g of x. So in this context, the x that f uses, this x, is not the same as this x because this entire group is being plugged into the other one, okay? And then in the other case, um, let me go with purple here. Here, f of x is being plugged into g, so x squared is plugged in. So this x is not the same as this x uh, right here, right? Because the entirety of this is being plugged into that x, okay? So I can say that, um, oops, wrong button. There we go. Here, x equals x squared, question mark, right? And so this can be very confusing if we use x as the input 
variable for two different functions. Because again, these two x's are not the same variable. We're merely using the same letter. They're two different functions. And they don't, like, I could say, well, what's f of 2? And then later, what's f of, uh, what's g of 2? But it's not the same 2. I'm just plugging 2 in. 2 is just a number. I can say f of 2 and g of 3. And it's not like, oh, you can't do that. You have to have both, and both have to be the same. If you have f of 2, you have to have g of 2, because they both use x. Well, no, they're not the same x. They're just using that letter in two different places. So what might be easier in some cases is to say, well, instead of calling uh, g of x, I could say instead, don't do that. Instead, say g of, I don't know, t equals t plus 2. Use a different letter for the input. Maybe that will be useful. Okay. So this is just um, a brief review of composite functions and what some of the issues can be surrounding them. So when we talk about um, the chain rule, which is how you handle derivatives of composite functions, I'm going to try to avoid uh, these issues here where x gets used for more than one thing. Uh, so hopefully this next example will make that uh, pretty clear. So I'm going to do a physical example to illustrate what the chain rule does while trying to avoid talking about calculus as much as possible. Um, basically, I'm going to try to illustrate the chain rule maybe in an indirect way. Hopefully that, that'll make sense halfway through, if not at the beginning. So let's say we have a, a piece of some piece of metal, okay? It's some kind of metal alloy. And let's say that it is um, at zero degrees Celsius, okay? Because, you know, when, when you heat metal, it expands, it becomes like larger, right? Let's say at zero degrees Celsius, um, the thing is 9,000 millimeters long, okay? So 90 centimeters, in other words. Or, I'm sorry, 900 centimeters, rather. Sorry. So let's say that the, the length as a function of its temperature is given by L of T, capital T, because I'm going to use lowercase t for something else later. Let's say it's equal to 5 big T plus 9,000. Okay? So if T is 0, if big T is 0, right, then I would have 5 times 0 plus 9,000, so 9,000. So when the temperature is 0, the length is 9,000 millimeters. So again, I'll say uh, this is the length in millimeters, and this is uh, the temperature in degrees Celsius. Okay. So let's say we have some oven that we have a very tight control on the temperature, and we can make the temperature increase at a very steady rate. So let's say that the temperature as a function of time equals 0.4 little t plus 10. And let's say that um, big T, this is the degrees in, in Celsius, okay, the temperature of the oven. And let's say it's totally uniform. It doesn't have hot spots or cold spots. And let's say that little t, this is in seconds. Okay, and so we are steadily raising the temperature of the oven. Okay. Now, I can say, well, oh, I'm almost running out of space here. Hmm. That, that's okay. Let's say that I have a big L of big T, of little t, I'm plugging the temperature function into the length function, okay? Well, this will be big L of 0 0.4 T plus 10, okay? Well, that's going to equal um, 5 times 0 0.4 little t plus 10, made an error there, plus 10. plus uh, 9,000. Sorry, I'm trying to undo that. Plus. Okay, so that's going to equal, well, 5 times 0.4 is 2, 2, t, plus 50, right, plus 9,000, equals 2, t, plus 9,050. Okay, so this is the length in millimeters, right, this is in millimeters, and the little t here is in seconds. So I have the length as a function of temperature. In fact, let me change colors here. I have the length of the length as a function of temperature for the, the object, and I have the uh, temperature of the oven as a function of time. If I put the piece of metal in the oven and let it heat up, 
then I can plug one function to the other and I can get the length of the piece of metal as a function of time as it sits in the oven, right? Hopefully that seems reasonable. So now what I can do is I can say, okay, what is the rate of change in the length as a function of temperature? I can say, okay, what is dl dt, big T, right? Well, that's the derivative of this function. So what's the derivative of 5t plus 9,000? Well, I've chosen this to be as simple as possible. Most of you have probably already figured this out or were expecting it to, to go this way anyway. Basically, that's 5. And notice this is in uh, millimeters oops, per degrees Celsius, right? That's the rate of change in the length as a function of time, uh, temperature, almost said time, temperature. Now I'm going to look for the derivative of this function, the rate of change in the temperature as a function of time for the oven. It's how does, fast does it heat up, basically. So d big T, d little t, well, that's the derivative of this function, so 0 0.4. 0 0.4, this is degrees Celsius per second, right? The temperature is changing as a function of time. Let's write that a little bit more neatly. There we go. So now I can ask, what is the rate of change in the length of the, um, the piece of metal as a function of time? Well, that's just the derivative of this function. So dl d little t, okay, dl d little t, this is going to be the derivative of this guy, so that's 2. 2, and this is millimeters per second. Okay, so now looking at these results here, I can pose a question, and I want you to, after I pose it, pause the video and think about it for a minute, and probably you'll figure out what, you know, what I'm getting at. Is there a way to get this result, this rate of change, the rate of change in the length as a function of time, using, without, without actually calculating out this function, but instead just using these two results? Is there a way to get two from those two? So assuming you've unpaused or you chose not to, you could multiply them, right? 5 times 0.4 gives you 0.2. And in particular, especially if you think back to um, physics or chemistry class in high school, probably almost all of you have taken chemistry. If you take two units like, oh, I had a bunch of horizontal space. Okay, that's fine. If you take 5 millimeters per degree Celsius and you multiply degrees Celsius and you multiply... 0 0.4 degrees Celsius per second, right? The degrees cancel. This is called dimensional analysis in, uh, in chemistry. So you get two millimeters per second. The, the units match up, right? And I get this. Well, that's what the product rule is. This, this right here, this is the product rule. Or, sorry, the chain rule. <laughs> this is the chain rule for the derivative, basically. The chain rule says if you want to find the derivative of a composite function, find the derivative of one function in the composite, and then find the derivative of the other function in the composite and multiply them together, and that's it. There's the derivative. So, and what you kind of got a peek of, more generally, if you have y is some function of u, and I'm avoiding using x for two different variables here, right? And u is some function of x, okay? Then dy du, well, this is just the derivative of that function, f prime of u. Just find the derivative, like we did with the length function. And then du dx, this is the derivative of the other function. So this would be g prime of x. This is the deri like, like the derivative of the um, temperature function. So the derivative of y, with this, um, y equals f of g of x with respect to x is the following. This is going to be dy dx. This equals dy du du times du dx. And this might make a lot of visual sense. This is, I, I think, one of the reasons that Leibniz, um, I'm not a historian, but I think this is one of the reasons that Leibniz chose this notation. Leibniz was one of the people who developed calculus. If you look at these as fractions, although they technically are not, if you pretend that they're fractions for a moment, cancel out the du's like we did up here with the, um, the degrees Celsius, right? Like they're units. Well, then you got dy dx on the right. So maybe this makes a lot of visual sense that this is true. Again, technically, they're not fractions. We'll get to that later. But they kind of behave like fractions, sort of. And another way to write this um, is, is the following. 
um, f of g of x prime. And this is the way that most books present the chain rule first, and then they often present this as an alternate secondary way. I think it should be the primary way because I think it's, I think it makes solving the problems easier for most students. Well, this is f prime of g of x, okay, which this guy right here, this is dy du, right? It's, it's, it's this derivative, f prime of whatever the input is. Well, u is g of x. So this guy right here, f prime of u, is this guy right here. It's identical. There's no difference. It's literally the same thing because u is g of x. It's just plugged in. Down here, I have it plugged in, whereas up here, I have it separated. That's the only difference. Okay, so uh, times g prime of x. This right here is this guy right here because we said it right there, du dx is g prime of x. I'm just treating um, the composite differently. I'm using u as the output of g and the input of f, whereas this formula does not. It just kind of does it all at once in one go. And so for, for someone who has... Once you get experience at, at using the chain rule, you've done it a few times, this is probably less writing, but I don't think it's easier to understand. So let's see how this would apply to the kind of problem you would see on a homework assignment. So I've got y equals 3x plus 1 parentheses to the fourth power. This is a composite function. The inside function is 3x plus 1. That on its own would be a function, and we could find the derivative of that. The outside function is the exponent. This is something to the fourth power, which if we had x to the fourth power, well, you could find the derivative of that. Let's avoid using x for two in two different places, though. I'm going to write this, uh, rewrite this as, um, I'm going to call this u. It's my in it's sort of a, a go-between variable that, that allows me to separate into two equations. So I've got y equals u to the fourth power, because I'm calling the parenthetical u, okay? And then we'll say that u equals 3x plus 1, okay? So now... Let me fix this plus so it doesn't look like a t. Now I can find the derivative separately, dy du, okay? That's the derivative of this function with respect to u. I'm not worried about x. Don't even think about the 3. The 3 is not relevant right now, and the 1 definitely is not. I'm just going to find the derivative using the power rule, 4u cubed. That's it, which maybe is not that hard. I'm trying to make that a better u, okay? Now I'm going to find du dx. And I'm going to ignore this while I do it. I'm going to focus on this. Okay. What is the derivative of this function? Well, 3. 3 is the derivative of that function. So now I've got the derivative of one component in the, compo in the composition and the derivative of the other component. So if I want the derivative of the composite function, the original, if I want dy dx, I need to multiply those two. So dy du times du dx. And if you want, you can try to memorize this as a formula or just memorize it as a procedure, which I'll review in a moment. So this equals 4u cubed times 3. Now we're not quite done because u is a variable that I made up as a go-between to help solve the problem. So I need to plug the 3x plus 1 back in. So this equals 4 times 3x plus 1 cubed. Okay, all I did was replace u with 3x plus 1 times 3. And of course, if I want, I can multiply the 4 and the 3 together and make 12 times 3x plus 1. So there's at least, there's at least two things to point out about this. Uh, the first thing is just the overall procedure. Again, you can memorize this as a formula if you want, but I don't think it's necessary. Basically, identify what you're going to call the inside part that you're going to separate into a separate function. Okay, so now you've got one function here and one function here. So you have to separate, you have basically, this is called decomposing the function into two functions. Then find the derivative of each one, ignoring the other half while you take care of the one half, and then multiply them together, and then uh, plug uh, the inside function back in. And that's basically it. Okay, it's, I guess it's a one, two, three, four, four step problem, I suppose. Um, another thing to point out is that after you've done this several times, you really can go from here to here in one step. Because I can look at the 4, okay, I know I'm going to use the power rule, so I'm, the 4 is going to get multiplied in front at some point. 
I can look at the 3x plus 1 and go, okay, the derivative of 3x plus 1 is 3. And I know that's also going to get multiplied in front at some point, right? This 4 and this 3 can then be combined to make 12. So I can get the 12 just on site. You have to have done this a few times. You're not going to, you know, out of, just out of the gate, your first time doing this. Oh, yeah, 12, sure, no problem. But after you've done it a few times, you can look ahead. You don't have to write all of this if you feel confident in, oh, yeah, I, that number goes there, that number goes there, that's fine. So later, you can do this in one step if you feel like you are confident doing it. But at least for a while, you really need to write out all of these steps. Obviously, if you do calculus in high school and this seems really simple and straightforward, well, then yeah, of course. But if, if this is your first time taking a calculus course, then you really need to write all this out, even if it seems tedious. Well, Zach said you don't need to write all that. Well, if you're new to this, then you do, at least for a while. And once you feel comfortable with like, yeah, I get this, this is not that hard, and you feel confident that you can do it mentally, then it's okay. But at least initially, you should always do these one step at a time. Okay, let's do another example. Uh, so this is one where um, there's a couple of ways to get started. So one thing I can do is say, okay, well, I know that my, my inside function is going to be x squared plus 1 because it's I have something inside the radical symbol, right? So I can say that y equals the square root of u. Just get started. And by the way, you don't have to use u. Use whatever letter you want. In fact, let's do this. Let's use v this time. The letter that you use does not matter. So then v equals x squared plus 1. Okay, um, now I need to find the derivative of each function separately. So here, the derivative, you might look at that and maybe you just remember the derivative of the square root of, of v, as we used to call it square root of x, but now we'll use v. Um, so you might just remember it, but I'll point out um, just in case that this is uh, v to the one half power, it can be re rewritten that way, and then we use the power rule. So dy dv equals one half times v to the negative one half power. Okay, and dv dx, this equals 2x, plus 0, but we don't need to write that. And I'll point out also the reason that I'm not writing y prime here, which we used to do often, is that y prime is not so specific. Do you mean the derivative of y with respect to x or the derivative of y with respect to v? Because dy dx is what we want as our answer at the end. dy dv is not the same thing, okay? So now I can say that dy dx, this equals, and I could cut this step if I wanted to. If I just remember, oh yeah, this is dy dv times dv dx. I don't have to write that part out. I can just put it into practice or put it in place. At least for a while, you really should write it out every time. That way it's totally solid. And, and once you, how to, how to say it? So. If you cut corners too early, you're more likely to make a mistake on a test or something. And that's not the best. You, you want to get, you want to do well in tests, for example. So maybe d delay cutting corners until you really feel confident. Anyway, this thing gives me uh, 1 half times v to the negative 1 half power times 2x. Okay. And although I do have x uh, here, I, I, I need to plug back in here where v is and get x there as well. So I'm going to plug x squared plus 1 in. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and not do any algebraic manipulations. You might be expecting me to do something, which I'll do at the end. I just don't want to do it yet. I want to complete the necessary calculus part before we clean up our answer using um, algebra. So there, there's the derivative. And depending on um, what you're doing, you might just stop there. Good enough, that's it. That's the deriv derivative. I don't need to simplify anything. Other times you might want to simplify. So let's go ahead and, and do that, assuming we need to. I think often on the online homework, you will be required to do some simplification. So, um, of course, these twos can cancel, right? This negative one exponent means that I'm really dividing that. I need to make a fraction and put that on bottom, x squared plus one in parentheses to the one half power. And you might be expecting another thing, but I'm just going to do that second. So x over x squared plus one to the one half power. And of course, just like I turned that, that root into a one-half power, I can turn that back into a root. So this is x over the square root of x squared plus 1. And there's our derivative, um, com completely simplified and done. Okay, One more example. Um, this one's maybe a little bit more complicated, but not too terribly so. Um, 
the first example we did, we could have done without the chain rule. It'd be possible. It'd just be a little bit tedious. Here with this one, if I wanted to avoid the chain rule, I, I could do it. I could rewrite this as uh, 4x squared plus 1 times 4x squared plus 1 times 4x squared plus 1, and then 12 more times at 15 factors and foil all that out and spend, I don't know, the better part of my Saturday or whatever just doing some algebra and then probably get it wrong anyway because I make a mistake somewhere in there. Like th th That's not what you want to do. So we're going to use the chain rule. So uh, y equals, uh, let's say, u to the 15th power, and u equals 4x squared plus 1. Okay. So now I can find the derivative of each function separately. dy du equals 15u to the 14th power. I'm just using the power rule for der the derivative. And then uh, du dx, this equals 8x. Okay. So now I can write down the chain rule, dy dx, and that's not a very good y. Let's fix that. dy dx, this equals dy du, times du dx. So this will be a 15u to the 14th power times 8x. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, I don't want to do two things at once. So I'll do 15 times 8, which is 120. 120x times u to the 14th power. And of course, I can't leave u in there. I need to replace that with x, uh, sorry, 4x squared plus 1. So 120x times 4x squared plus 1 to the 14th power. And as I said before, once you feel really confident doing this, you probably could, if you wanted to, go from here to here in a single step. Um, a, provide the numbers aren't too big. This is kind of bordering on uh, 15 is kind of a big number. You know, doing 15 times 8 in your head is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world. So maybe if the numbers are big enough, maybe just write it all out. But, you know, you could at some point when you feel confident, you know, you could say, okay, well, I know it's going to be 15 times... 4 times 2x, 4x squared, plus 1 to the 14th. And then do the arithmetic afterward. That, that's something you could do. If, if you felt confident in doing the power rule, chain rule step all at once, you could do that. Um, a shortcut that you could use is that if, um, if you want the derivative of, let's say, um, let's say we have Let's say we have this. We've got f of x, some function, raised to some power, let's say n prime. Well, then that derivative, and in fact, I'm probably going to run out of horizontal room here. Let's do this. That's always going to equal n times f of x to the n minus 1 power times f prime of x which is basically what I did up here. So it's a bit of a shortcut. This is sometimes called the generalized power rule. Because it uses the power rule and the chain rule together in, in one step. So you can use that as a shortcut if you want to. Anyway, there's that example. OK, so now we need to talk about a formula that you are probably familiar with that we are going to repurpose a little bit. We have to modify it. So uh, if you have the equation a equals p times 1 plus r over n to the nt power, this is basically the um, 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 compound interest formula. A stands for the amount of some investments. So we'll call this an amount. Amount. And then p, this is the principal. R, this is the rate given as a percent. Okay, so something like if R, e if you have 8%, then R equals 0 0.08, okay? Uh, N is the number of compoundings per period. Well, I'm sorry, number of compounding periods per year. So compoundings per year. And then t is the number of years. Um, for what we're going to use 
this formula for in calculus, this is not quite going to work out. How This will be problematic because of the scale of r. If I increase r by 1, I would have 1.08. So that would be going from 8% interest to 108% interest, which is not what I want. So in this modified formula, most of the things are the same, a, p, n, t, but r, this is the rate, not as a percent, but just as a raw number. So 8%, this corresponds to r equals 8. So if I were to increment r by one unit, I'd go from 8% to 9%. So that's going to make this formula more useful for applications involving interest rates, because then I can look at, well, what's the marginal, right? Remember, the marginal is what, what's the change if you do one more? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do um, in the next example. So what is the marginal benefit of 9% annual percentage rate over 8% annual percentage rate on a deposit of $5,000 compounded monthly for 12 years? Okay, so we're going to use the formula. Um, let me change my stylus here. We're going to use the formula A equals P times 1 plus R over 100N to the NT power. Okay, so... Um, R is going to be our variable because we're looking at what is the marginal benefit of changing the interest rate. So R is a variable. Um, the principal is 5,000. The number of compoundings is uh, 12 or monthly. And the number of years is 12 years. So um, our function A, the amount as a function of the interest rate is going to be 5,000 times 1 plus R over 1,200. Okay. Times... Uh, well, that's going to be 140, I'm sorry, not times, but to, to the power of, rather, 144. The number of compoundings per year times the number of years. So this is a function, and it's a composite function. So if I want to find, well, what is the derivative, so I can talk about the marginal benefit of changing the interest rate, I kind of want to use uh, the chain rule. So, again, because the exponent is so high, I mean, I guess I don't have to, but uh, how long would that take to do by hand through foiling things out and then using the power rule term by term? That would be ridiculous. So there's no way we can, there's no practical way to do that. So I'm going to make up um, a go between variable. I'll call this on a V for, uh, uh, well, not to represent anything. It's not a value. It's just, I had picked a letter on V for variable because I'm making a variable. So A equals 5,000 V to the 144th power. And V equals 1 plus, I'm going to rewrite this slightly to make the some of the steps a little bit clearer, 1 over 1,200 times R. R over 1,200 could be rewritten as 1 over 1,200 times R. So when I go to find the derivatives, dA, dV, okay, this will be, well, I'll use the power rule, so that's going to be what? 720,000? I believe that's correct, but let me grab a calculator and, and check. Um, I don't want this throwing off the whole problem, having a, uh, an error this early. Yeah, 720,000 times V to the 143rd power. Okay, and then dV dr, right, this will be uh, 1 over 1,200. If that's not obvious, think about this as being like, um, you know, mx plus b is the, the formula for, like, line, right? So just think of it as being b plus mx. Same thing, and so the derivative is the slope. Okay, so now to find the um, dVdr, I just multiply these two things together. dV, or sorry, rather dA dV times dV dr. This equals um, 720,000 times V to the 143rd power times 1 over 1,200. Okay, I'm guessing... 72,000 and 1,200 will reduce quite a bit. Is that 600? Yeah, 600. So this is 600 times uh, V to the 143rd power. Now, of course, V is not the original variable, so I have to plug the 1 plus R over 1,200 back in. So this equals 600 times 1 plus R over 1,200 raised to the 140... Uh, oops... 143rd power. I almost was just copying from here because I was looking at it here. 
So be careful about that when you're when you're re rewriting things from above. Be careful that you're not you know writing down the wrong thing. So here is our marginal. Um, oh, I made a mistake here. D A D R. D A D R. Yeah. Okay. I want the the derivative of the amount as a function of the rate. Okay. So if I want to find, well, what is the marginal change going from eight to nine? I want to evaluate this guy at eight. So here's some notation we, I don't think we've had yet. If I had r, uh, sorry, a is a function of r like this, then the derivative would be a prime of r, but we're not using the prime notation just because it's, it's not as specific as it could be. So um, the proper notation is da dr, and then a vertical line, and I'll put an eight here. That means plug eight into the function that we found. Um, this notation might seem kind of nowhere, but this is the notation when you're using the Leibniz notation for, der for the derivative to say we're plugging in a number. And also in chapter 13, this will come up again later. So it doesn't hurt to do it now because later we'll, we'll need to use it. That's the standard notation later as well. So this could be 600, oops, 100, times one plus eight over 1200 raised to the 143rd power. So I'll throw this in a calculator and see what we get. So 600 times 1 plus 8 over 1,200 raised to the 143rd power. So we are estimating the marginal benefit. So this is 1,551.69. And I'm, this is you know, dollars, so I'm running to two places because this is uh, $1,551.69. Okay. Well, what does this represent? This is the marginal benefit of going from 8% to 9% APR. So this is the additional yield over the entire period for that increase from 8 to 9. So this is the total additional yield. Uh, well, basically, um, going from 8 to 9, let's put it that way. Going from eight, eight percent APR, oops, ARP APR to nine percent APR. Okay. So of course, when the interest rate goes up, the yield goes up. But yeah, but by how much? Well, now we know how to quantify it. It goes up by this amount. Okay. So let's do an example that's going to be a little bit more complicated. The reason it's going to be complicated is that I have a product, I have a function times another function. So I'm going to use the product rule, but also that second function is a composite function, so I'm going to have to use the chain rule. There's a couple ways to get started, and I'm going to start by just saying, okay, this is uh, u, and this is v, okay? So the product rule tells me if I want dy dx, well, I need to get du dx times v, which we would often call this u prime, but this is the same thing, plus u times dv dx, okay? And often we call this v prime, but same thing. So I need the derivative of this guy in order to proceed with the product rule. So off to the side over here, I'm going to say, okay, v equals 2x minus 1 cubed, and I'm going to settle the chain rule and then go back to finishing the product rule after the chain rule is done. So because this is because this is a composite, I need to break it into two pieces. So I'm going to call the inside a uh, say w. Just pick a letter, it doesn't really matter what you use. So uh if I say that v equals w cubed, then w equals 2x minus 1. Okay? So then I can say, well what is dv dw? dv dw that's the derivative of this function, so 3w squared, okay? And then dw dx, okay? This is going to be, well, 2, right? So the chain rule tells me that dv dx, remember that's this guy that we need for the product rule, this equals uh, dv dw times dw dx, okay? So this will be dv dw, so 3w squared, times 
dw dx, or 2 in other words. So I'll combine the 2 and the 3 to make 6, and I'll put the w back in, 2x minus 1 squared. So all of this, the chain rule, found me this component of the product rule, dv dx. So now I can proceed with the product rule. You don't have to do it in this order, but I think maybe this is the most straightforward way to do it. So this equals, well, du dx is the derivative of this guy, which isn't that hard, 2x. 2x times v, which is the other function, so 2x minus 1 in parentheses cubed, plus uh, u, which is x squared. I'm going to run out of room, well, it's going to get crowded at least, so I'm going to move this over. And I can pretend that this was moved over the whole time if I want to. So times dv dx, this guy down here. So 6 times 2x minus 1 squared. And you might notice that um, both, both terms from the product rule have x as a factor, so I could factor out x. Uh, both um, have 2x minus 1, at least they have multiple copies of 2x minus 1. So if I want, I could factor. If I want, I can distribute and combine like terms. It doesn't really matter um, which one I do most of the time. It depends, well, it depends on what I'm doing next. If I am going to use this to solve an application problem, I might want to factor. Um, let's go ahead and distribute and see how that goes, and then we'll also factor. So we see both. So you know what? Let's not, let's not distribute. That's going to be a pain. Let's only factor. Sorry. So um, looking at the two terms, I notice they each have at least one copy of x as a factor, and they each have at least two copies of 2x minus 1 as a factor. So I'm going to factor out x times 2x minus 1 squared. Okay, so in the first term, what's left over? Well, the 2 is still there, and one copy of 2x minus 1 is still there. In the second term, what's left over? Well, one copy of x, the 6, so 6x, so plus 6x. And then I can distribute within these parentheses, not, not distribute this back or anything. I mean distribute this 2 to uh, across these parentheses. Um, basically, multiply this guy here and here. So this is x times 2x minus 1 squared times 4x minus 2 plus 6x. So this is, you know what? I could have factored out a 2 as well. I didn't notice that. Let's go ahead and do that now. Basically, I overlooked the fact that this has a, that this has a 2 and 6 has 2 as a factor. So let's go ahead and, um, let's go ahead and correct that. The 2 really ought to be here. and not here and not here. Yeah, in fact, yeah, that's just simpler, so. So this, this is one of the reasons it's important to factor as much as possible. You save yourself a lot of arithmetic if you factor as early as possible, and then you don't need to deal with factoring later. So there you go. That's basically as simple as the answer gets. I think that um, if you had a problem like this on my math lab, it would accept this answer most likely, um, but potentially you would need to do this, potentially. And potentially you would need to distribute, potentially, um, but let's not do that in this case.